anybody tired this morning? I, I, I was really struggling. And sometimes, honestly, I was so tired this morning. I was wondering if I was having a health issues, not, not COVID. But I'm getting older. You know, I wonder if I have plugged arteries or something, you know, and you don't have the energy that you used to. And I was reminded of what one preacher said years ago. He said, you know what, what, would, you know what you'd have if you took every Baptist and laid him down in a pew end to end? They'd be a whole lot more comfortable. And, then, and I, I wondered if that's what I needed to do this morning, but I didn't. I fought it. So anyway, yeah. And we wanted to tell you again. Last week, my, my joke about snowmen fell flat. So what does one snowman say to the other snowman? Do you smell carrots? And I, I still think that's funny. And you don't. So if you don't start laughing at that joke, I'm going to say it every Sunday morning until you do. How's that? <laughs> there you go. I feel like a success now. Thank you, Wendy. All right. Why don't you stand with me, please, as we honor God's word in Matthew chapter 2. And the Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of, of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? But For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he had found him, bring ye word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Heavenly Father, thank you for... This record of your birth, the gifts of the wise men after the birth, the plotting of Herod to destroy the birth, and all that has taken place in the plan of salvation for Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sins. Lord, last Sunday we talked about that great rescue and how desperately we needed it. I'm thankful that we have it. And once again, we'll look into your word this morning, and I pray that we would choose to believe the word of God. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> According to a recent Gallup poll, you may be seated. I was supposed to say that, wasn't I? According to a recent Gallup poll, there are a few things that Americans, there are a few things that Americans are more united on about than celebrating Christmas. 95% of Americans celebrate the holiday, with 85% of non-religious Americans observing one of the two most important holidays of the Christian faith. Of course, that would be Christmas and Easter. But as you might expect, the unity begins to fade as the focus shifts to the story of the manger. According to Pew Research, only 57% actually believe the key elements of the Christmas story. 66% believe Jesus was born of a virgin. 75% believe he was laid in a manger. 67% agree angels announced his birth. And 68% believe a star guided the wise men to the Messiah. So obviously there is not unanimity on the belief of the story that you and I have read in Matthew chapter 2 and, of course, Luke chapter 2. Foundational truth is what shapes our thinking. Just as the shape of a foundation determines the structure of a building, the foundational truth that you believe is what shapes your outlook on life. What you will believe will determine the choices that you make. If you're a sports fan, for instance... 
you'll be excited or depressed depending on the belief that you have in your team. If you're a New York Jets fan, for instance, you'd be greatly depressed at your team this year, or having only won one game and looking like they'll never win again. So you'd be a depressed individual if you're a Jets fan. In 2007, the New England Patriots went 18-0, and only to lose in the Super Bowl to the New York Giants. I'm still struggling with that loss. I believe the two... Now, this is what I believe now. We're talking about what we believe. I believe the 2007 New England Patriots were probably the best football team that was ever put together. Now, the New York Giants would disagree with that statistic. The New York Giants were only 10-6 and six that year, but they went 4-0 and all in the playoffs, and New England went 2-1 and one in the playoffs, and... Obviously, it is in the final analysis of life that what is what really matters. In the final analysis in 2007, 18 and 1 didn't cut it. And in the final analysis, when we stand before God, your excuses as to why you decided not to believe his holy word that he gave us will not cut it. What we believe matters. Foundational truth matters. Just over half of Americans believe in the Christmas story. So that begs the question, not just of the Christmas story, but all the events of the Bible, are they fact or fiction? Biblical belief or worldly wisdom? There have been smarter people than you and I that had wrestled with this problem. Jesus stood before Pilate and declared in John chapter 18, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest, I am a king, and to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And I don't know about you, but I tend to ask that question nowadays as you're looking at politics. And obviously, Pilate was a very political figure. And in the wrangling that was going on at the time of the crucifixion of Christ, when the Jews were wanting to take over and the Romans were in control, and Pilate's caught in the middle, not wanting to give up his position and trying to keep the Jews happy, but not wanting to lose his power with Rome. And I can imagine the the battle was constant kind of remind you of the Democrats and the Republicans and trying to keep power and saying whatever they want to say to think that they can please whoever they want to please. And every now and then you and I get an opportunity to vote and we vote and we vote and we vote. It seems like nothing ever changes. And we hear people tell us things that we think is true and come to find out they were just a bunch of liars all along. Am I all alone in that process? Pilate says, and you and I could ask, what is truth? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to know this book right here is truth. And you can bank on it, and you can believe it. Biblical belief or worldly wisdom, and Pilate says, what is truth? Buddha said at the end of his life, I am still searching for truth. You don't hear that about him, do you? John Paul Sartre, the great French existentialist, said of truth, it is hopeless. You cannot find ultimate truth. The Apostle Paul wrote of these people ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We would say in 2020, educated above their intelligence. Satan does not want you to find the truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. And freedom that Jesus promises is not what the enemy wants you to have. He wants you in bondage. If you discovered the truth from God's word, the enemy will come and try to steal it away. Jesus tells that story when he talks about the sower in Luke chapter 8. The sower went out to sow and he broadcasts the seed. And birds come by and steal it. That was truth was deposited. The word of God is deposited, but Satan will come right by and he'll try to take it as quickly as it can before it catches root in your life. And heaven forbid you hear the truth. 
Satan is the enemy of truth. He's constantly trying to snatch it away. In the 1940s, there were two evangelists that were very prominent, both of them very successful, taking the world by storm, doing great things for the cause of Christ. One man's name was Chuck Templeton. The other man was Billy Graham. When Billy started out, he was convinced that the Bible was the word of God. But then he started reading some authors that were not so sure and worldly wisdom and liberal theology was starting to combine in the writings of the day. Theistic evolution in the Genesis account of creation was coming in. and The Bible teaches that God created the world in six days, but there was a group of people that wanted very much to pacify science falsely so-called according to God's word, and Christian people. So they came up with a, 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 a teaching that is not uncommon now in certain liberal circles called either the day-age theory or theistic evolution. And what they do is they take the passage that in Second Peter where a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day to God, and they take the six days of creation, and they tell you, oh, no, that is not six literal days, but that is six time frames that God used over thousands of years and possibly even billions of years. It's possible that God started the creative process, and he used evolution to make it happen so that, yes, is a creative God, but guided through evolution, here we are today. And if you adopt that philosophy of trying to marry God's truth with worldly wisdom, you will come up with this convoluted liberal theology that breaks down on so many levels. We believe in the six days of creation because the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. No death happened before sin. The Bible teaches that. If you take an evolutionary process of over billions of years, evolution requires death and dying and layers and layers of death and dying for billions of years to finally come up with something that looks like you and I. God did not do that. Death did not happen until Adam sinned in the garden. For Adam to sin in the garden, that means that God created the earth in six days, and in six days, God spoke it into happening, and it happened. Some will say the Big Bang Theory. Some will say God spoke, and bang, it happened. However you want to look at it, I want you to know that there is no room in God's word for billions of years of the creative process. It does not work. I know that's controversial, but Satan wants very much. He has always worked by the process of, yea, hath God said? And as liberals creep in, really, it's the hiss of the snake saying, really, question, 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 question this word right here. And when you do that, especially for someone trying to find the truth, you cannot make everyone happy when it comes to truth. Truth stands by itself. And for you and I as Christians, I don't know about you, I want people like me. I want people to say, oh, it's Stan Griffin. What a funny guy. I love him. He's such a good guy. So loving. What a great hugger. He's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. But that's not what we're called to do in Christ. I want you to know, as a Christian, Christian is only one person you need to make sure is happy with you, and his name is Jesus. Everything else, I'm afraid, at times will come and go. We talked about it last Sunday night in our evening Bible study, but I want you to know that I have no control. The only real steady thing in my life is not the Cornerstone Baptist Church, not my family, it's not my wife. I expect to be married to Emily for a very long time. 
she may find a better offer. Now, I know that would be shocking to anybody with any common sense. It's not a guarantee that her and I will be together forever. I expect it to be so. I don't believe in divorce. The Bible says God hates divorce. That's another conversation altogether. I don't believe in murder, but she might kill me. I don't, but I don't, but I want you to know that nothing, you have no control over anything. The only constant in your life is God Almighty. There is nothing else we are sure of. And when we try to hang on to certain things and and try to guarantee certain things, that is not possible. In America today, we're trying to guarantee safety for the individual. That is not possible. In America today, we're trying to guarantee a certain income or certain things to take place to make sure that life is fair. That is not possible. The only thing I know that I have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. He will never fail. He will never leave me. And you can take that to the bank. Anything else, sorry. There's no guarantees of anything other than a relationship with Jesus Christ because he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. No one else can say that. Truth. When Billy started out, he was convinced the Bible was the word of God. But he started reading some authors that were not sure and worldly wisdom and liberal theology was starting to combine theistic evolution into the genesis of counter-creation. God created the world but used billions of years to do so. Some call it the day-age theory. The Bible teaches a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day in 2 Peter 3, 8. And just as the Garden of Eden when the serpent asked, yea, hath God said, so are liberals questioning God's word today. Billy's good friend Chuck Templeton also a very successful evangelist, confronted Billy and said, Billy, you're 50 years out of date. People no longer accept the Bible as being inspired the way you do. Your faith is too simple. Your language is out of date. You're going to have to learn the new jargon if you're going to be successful in the ministry. As you can well imagine, these comments were both painful and troubled Billy's faith. He struggled with whether he was correct in what he believed about the Bible being true. He saw how Jesus taught the Old Testament was true. He saw how Christ had endorsed the record of Jonah and Noah. He saw how the Bible claimed to be the perfect word of God and not brought by men, but God breathed. And 2 Timothy 3.16, for all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And obviously it goes on, that passage, that the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Finally, he left his room on an August night and walked out into the woods and laid his Bible on a stump. He got down on his knees, and he confessed that he did not have all the answers to the questions that people were espousing. But he was going to accept God's word by faith. He said, I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts. He said when he got up off his knees, he sensed God's power and presence like he had not sensed in months. Not all my questions had been answered, but a major bridge had been crossed. In my heart and mind, I knew a spiritual battle had been fought and won. Chuck Templeton would later leave the ministry and go into secular life. He was successful by the world standards in politics, writing, and radio, and other endeavors. In 1995, he wrote a book entitled Farewell to God, where he describes his transition from Christianity to agnosticism and his reasons for doing so. And of course, there's atheism and there's agnosticism. Atheist says there is no God. Agnosticism is just one level different from that. It says we can't know for sure if there is a God. And I hope that when you hear of a Christian writing a book called Farewell to God, that that bothers you as much as it does me. 
Because that story breaks my heart. I would rather die penniless believing in Christ than be wealthy by the world's standards and not believe. 57% of people believe the key elements of the Christian story. That means 43% do not. 66% believe that Jesus was virgin born. Others believe that he was either the illegitimate son of a Roman soldier or possibly the product of rape. But obviously we know that Mary was a virgin. 75% believe that he laid in a manger. 67% believe angels announced his birth. 68% believe a star guided the wise men. So here we are in the end of 2020, the last Sunday of the year. Someone said on the left coast that wearing a, not wearing a mask is akin to terrorism. Is that true? Earlier in the year, we were told that we'd shut things down for just a couple of weeks to sl- flatten the curve. Was that true? A great line in the movie. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. And I'm afraid today we're coddled and led along. And I mentioned a few weeks ago, I feel like I'm an animal in a circus. And there's a ringleader out there trying to get us to do whatever move they can make us. And if we don't, they crack the whip. In the struggles we've seen in the pandemic and in the elections, one thing has bothered me more than anything else. Not only is truth hard to come by, but many people are not even looking for it. They have no desire for it. As Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And I'm afraid that no one has ears to hear in the United States of America anymore. Not just biblical truth, but any kind of truth. We're so caught up in our own personal pleasure. We're going here and going there, burying our heads in the sand and refusing to engage in the agenda and the life of the day. And I want you to know as a Christian, that is not an option for us. We're called We're Christians. We'll talk about some of those things tonight. But I have good news. It's called the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, Paul is speaking, that which I also received. I've shared with you what I was told. I think you and I would do well to share with others what we've been told. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And then 1 Corinthians 15 goes and talks about, after his resurrection, he was seen by 500 men and the apostles. And some are still with us, and some are fallen asleep. In other words, passed away. And I want you to know that there came a time in my life when I just decided, like Billy Graham, and I'm no Billy Graham, but every one of us needs to decide for ourselves Are you going to believe the truth of God's word? Recently, I had the privilege of preaching the funeral of one of the dads of the men that attend this church. Grown up in a Catholic church, absolutely religious, knowing the foundational truths of the gospel. The Catholic church will teach you that Jesus died, that he rose. They emphasized Mary too much. Mary was just a a wonderful young lady, not sinless, a virgin, that was used to bring the Christ child into the world. The Bible teaches after that she had children of her own. You can't pray to Mary. Mary can't hear you any more than any deceased relative can hear you that's gone to heaven. We have one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the one we talk to. He's the one we confess our sins to. He wants to hear from you. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I understand the idea that Mary can go to Jesus and get the things that for you that we couldn't get ourselves because she knows him. She's her mom. But the Bible teaches against that. She was outside of one of the places where... 
Jesus was meeting and many people were talking to him and, and the disciples told him, hey, your mom's outside, your family's outside and they want to speak to you. And Jesus looked at him and said, this is my family, this is my brethren right here. And he paid no more special respect to Mary than he did the crowd he was ministering to. That is not downplaying Mary, thank God for Mary. But she's not a special individual other than being the mom of Jesus Christ, the earthly mom. The heavenly father, of course, is his dad. His father, he had no earthly father. So I, had the, I started by saying I had the privilege of preaching that man's funeral. And he and I had several conversations before he passed away. And finally, I looked at him. and He had questions that he wasn't sure of because his church had taught him this, and I was saying this, and he wasn't sure of. And I said, look, it's like this. I said, Mark Twain says, I don't, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the things in the Bible I do understand that bother me. You will never have all the answers to this book right here. It's God's word. Newsflash. God's smarter than you and I are. Ever have a conversation with someone that was smarter than you are, and some of the time it's just, yeah, okay. You just, you know they're right, but I'm just not with you on this. Well, I read this book, and there are times where I'm just, I'm just a college dropout, folks. I am not. If you're looking for super intelligent, you came to the wrong place. You need to go somewhere. But... God has given us a certain amount of common sense. And there's a lot of this book that makes absolute sense to me. I absolutely understand it, and I'm going to believe it. The parts that I don't understand, I accept by faith. And someday, I'm going to meet the author personally. And any questions I have, I'm positive I will be filled in on. Finally, I looked at this gentleman, and I said, I can't answer all your questions. But I said... I believe, and you and I agree, that Jesus was here, that he was human, that he was sinless, that he died, that he rose again, and he's now in heaven. You believe that, don't you? He said, yes, I do. And I said, well, I think we have a problem here because I think you're going to miss heaven by 18 inches. I think you know it all in your head, but you've never trusted Jesus in your heart. And I said, have you ever prayed to ask Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior? He said, no, I never have. And I said, let's do that right now. And I am here to tell you that on October 22nd of 2020, with two other witnesses in the room, he and I prayed to trust Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And when I stood over his casket, I had the privilege of sharing that with everyone that would listen. And I know for a fact, based on this book right here, that that man is in the presence of God Almighty. That's good news, folks. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every one of us, see, it's at the end of the day. Not did you live perfectly? Did you get all your jobs done? Did, every, did you accomplish all of your goals? None of that matters. What matters is the foundational truth that you know in your heart of hearts that I believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again and he took my place on the cross and if I will trust him as my Savior and say so, not just think it, but say so. We say it in prayer. And when we do that, I don't understand it all, but I know for a fact the Bible calls me in John chapter 3, born again, I get a new life in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And I want you to know, this old body has tired feet, itchy hands, skin conditions. I'm allergic to the world. I'm allergic to everything. I'm looking forward to the day when I get a brand new body. I used to brag about how good looking, how healthy I was. Those days are gone. Look in the mirror, folks. It's over for Stan Griffin, but it's not over because I got good news. He's going to give me a whole new start someday. I'm going to get a new life in Christ. Folks, those are things I celebrate. I don't happen to like the governor. 
I'm not sure I'm going to like the president. All of the things that are happening that are going on in life sometimes get me down. But when you open up this book right here, I want you to know there's truth involved. And you can trust it. You can believe it. And you can follow it. And life excites me because of Jesus Christ. Amen? So there's two things going on here. Number one, if you haven't trusted Christ as your personal Savior, what do you believe? Really, what do you believe? A lot of people say, well, you know, some, I, I think you're right. And boy, golly, I promise you before I die, I'm going to do that. No, no, it doesn't work that way. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is, this is the day of salvation. Today's the day. Say that with me. Today's the day. Don't blow it for another day. You don't gain a thing by putting off Christ. You gain everything by putting on Christ. And then, for you and I as Christians, we've already made that decision. <laughs> I mentioned it to Emily last night. She has the, the, the responsibility and the horror of living with the pastor. And I, I said, you know, if we stood before God tonight, not for our entire life, but just for 2020... How do you think we did? I'm afraid. The year 2020, I, I don't know that we'd done all that hot, folks. I don't know what we could have done better, but I don't, I'm not walking away from 2020 saying, by golly, thank God we accomplished our goals this year. I think, I don't know. I don't have an easy feeling about how we did this year. And for me, I want to do better next year. I don't, want, I don't want to repeat it this year at all. But only God can determine that. And only you can be determined in your heart and life that you want to do that. And so I would encourage you, if you know Christ is your personal Savior, good news. But I'd also encourage you that next year is coming, and it's just a few days off, and it's another start, and it's called 2021. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to honor the Lord in 2021. I want to give him my best, and I want 2020 to be in the rearview mirror. And whatever I didn't do well in 2020, I want to say, Lord, I am sorry. Help me to do better in 2021. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, I hope that every person in this room has said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. I hope that they believe in you. And Lord, we, you said that we would, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we need to say so. You said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So Lord, if there are people here this morning that have never prayed, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, that they say those words right now. Dear Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my heart and be my Savior. Then, Lord, help them to say, I believe in you. Help me to trust you. I put my faith, my thoughts, I give them all to you. I believe. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. What I hope folks would say those words. If they did, I hope they'd tell their wife, their husband, their son, their daughter, maybe whoever they came with, whoever they're going home to. Let people know today, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I am a Christian. I pray they'd say so. And Lord, for us as Christians, Lord, I am not happy with 2020. I don't like it. It didn't go well. And I ask for your forgiveness for a bad attitude, for areas I could have done better that I did not. As a pastor of this church, I pray that you would allow us in the year ahead to do a job that would please you. And I hope that we did in 2020, but every year we hope to do better. 
So Lord, we'll open the altar. We'll give folks a chance to respond. If folks have questions, if they want someone to pray with, whatever they need, we want them to have an opportunity to do that. Bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.